Hey guys, it's Down Phoenix. Fuck above in a tough. Fuck you. Top five nostalgia games. Okay, so it's not actually Down Phoenix doing this video because he already did one where he talked about his top five nostalgia games. And if you're familiar with those tag videos, guess who he tagged? So now, and since with him bugging me about putting this video out, I figured I'd, I'd amuse him. Plus, it gets a lot of video for you guys to see, and, well, you get to see a little bit of what I would consider my top five nostalgic games. Now, while going through my list of top five nostalgic games, I noticed that for the most part, actually, not even for the most part, for all of it, it's mostly Super Nintendo games. So it seems kind of a little weird to me to call them the nostalgic games, so I decided to call them the top five nostalgic Super Nintendo games. I don't know why it's only a top five, guess we're all lazy and stuff, because, you know, we get top tens and ten plus ones. So let's do this. Oh, and just to note, not ranking any of these nostalgic games in any particular order. I mean, some of them I do feel a little bit more nostalgic towards, but otherwise, um, there's no ranking to them, so keep that in mind. So starting off this top 5 nostalgic SNES games is the Donkey Kong Trilogy. Although that seems kind of cheap, just having three games right off the bat and kind of like a cheap way to get out. So I'm just only going to pick one of them, but I figured I'd bring up the other two as uh, being nostalgic to me as well. But the most nostalgic is the original Donkey Kong Country. Why? Well, I still remember how amazing it was and this game aged really, really well. Like, it's still a lot of fun to play. Still great to look at, great to listen, and just like all around, it's just like still one of my favorites. Like I would pop this into my Super Nintendo any time of the day, any time of the week, of all time to play because it's just back then it was just such a it was it just looked amazing to me. Like it looked great, and it still looks great with its uh, pseudo 3D pre-rendered graphic or computerized graphics. It was. Just, it looked so cool. And not only that, the music sounded great too, especially, like, it was very fitting in a lot of the levels too. Like, it was very appropriate and it sounded great too. Mm, the map music definitely is such a, like, a nice jingle. The like, it's just like, that's so nostalgic. Like, it just brings me back. And the gameplay, it's a platformer, but uh, there's something about it feels really satisfying when playing when going through the levels it's just it, it feels right it feels like it's done right and it's still very very nostalgic to me plus there's two player weapons that you can play with another person or if you're by yourself you just play with two two kongs and just go through the levels going through um donkey kong country and getting some bananas back so yeah this would be one of my uh nostalgic snes games Next on the list is the Kirby games I've owned. I'm actually missing one of them, Kirby's Avalanche, because someone destroyed that one, but I still have the other two here. Jer Jerby. <laughs> Kirby's Dream Course and Kirby's Superstar. And I was kind of a little conflicted on which one's more nostalgic, because I feel more nostalgia for Kirby's Dream Course, because essentially it's a golf game with uh, Kirby and a few other mechanics that make it really, really, uh, quirky and fun to play, especially the two-player mode. Like, that, the two-player mode was great. Always trolled my cousins, and my cousin trolled me, and, well, we trolled everyone who played it. Essentially, nobody went for the goal. Everyone just, like, whoever was playing, just knocked each other off the, off the, off the, um, the course, and just, like, watched their energy bar go down, and just keeps going and going. And the fun part was grabbing all the power-ups, to like uh, have all these effects that would fuck up the other player. Like uh, the fireball would set them on fire. The electricity would shock them, shock them and make them lose energy. Or the freeze to make them uh, be frozen. Or the spike, spike or rock with the rock like squashing them. Or the spike uh, like poking them and stabbing them. Like nostalgic wise, I think this one wins over Kirby Superstar. Like Kirby Superstar is great too. Uh, Eight games in one, although I think that's a little... Actually, yeah, eight games in one plus two mini-games. Like, uh... 
great game, but nostalgic wise, I feel more for Dream Course. Dream Course was just a lot of fun. Music once again sounds great, and also it looks the the graphics also look really really clean. Like it just feels very refreshing and just very very clean. Like just since it's not overloaded with details on it. But yeah, definitely. If I had to say between the two, Kirby Superstar is a better game, but this but uh, Dream Course. I feel a lot more nostalgic for, especially when you play with people. And both games have two player modes too. Kirby Superstar, Kirby Superstar being better, but this one is just a lot more. With the Dream Course, a lot more nostalgic. Kirby's Dream Course, a lot more nostalgic, and just like, you know, I would like to play it again with uh, someone and just completely fool around in the multiplayer. So, yeah. Kirby's Dream Course wins in a nostalgic factor over Kirby Superstar. Even though it's a much better game. Next one on the list, Super Mario RPG. Probably my favorite RPG of all time because uh, not only do I think it's the greatest of them, it also corrupted my taste for RPGs because all your other RPGs suck if they don't have timed hits or mechanics like Super Mario RPG that just make it so much more engaging. Let's see, what's so nostalgic about it? Well, once again, kind of like with the Donkey Kong Country series, it wowed, it really wowed me with how it looks, with uh, pseudo 3D and uh, pre-rendered graphics. Like, it was just so cool. You don't see that anywhere on any other games. Every game's all on a 2D sprite plane. Yeah, I know Donkey Kong Country was on, was on a 2D plane too, but it looked and felt like it was kind of 3D without being 3D, hence being called pseudo 3D. 3D pseudo 3d but yeah i just i also remember this too like uh this game man i accomplished so much in this game as a kid like figuring out all that stuff figuring out all like the things you gotta do to get through the game and i think this game also helped me with my uh with my english too because uh, you had to read a lot and a lot of the stuff i didn't get so i had to actually eventually learn the, one of the most nostalgic, memorable things is when you're in the sunken ship and you gotta like, and you gotta get the password to open the door. I was stuck there for the longest time without knowing like, like what, what's the password? I don't get it. Like, like it's not hard for an adult to figure out what it is, but for a kid, like uh, back in uh, grade three, like it was like, what, what is this? Eventually, I did figure it out, and I felt really accomplished doing that. Plus, I really, really, really like the combat system. More RPGs need to... I feel more RPGs need to have the timed hit system where you're involved in the fight and not something stupid like, uh, say, for instance, Final Fantasy, which I don't like because it sucks, mainly for the combat. But uh, it's funny because Square made this and they made Final Fantasy, so clearly Square knows what they're doing, just not well enough. But the timed hit mechanic, it's just so great, like, like, if you press, if you press your, uh, if you time your button presses right, you always hit and always do a critical, and when an enemy attacks you, if you press it the right time, you can, you will block it and reduce, greatly reduce the damage or take no damage at all, which was what, what was really cool, it was very, very involving, unlike Final Fantasy, or, <clears throat> dare I say it, Chrono Trigger, where you're just completely depending on, you're just relying on your characters to hope they'll dodge the attack, hope they'll not miss, hope they'll do a critical, just like, you, you have no involvement or real influence over that except, you know, grinding them up. Mario RPG, there is a little bit of grinding as I found out a little later, but, um, but overall, like, you have control over the combat. The only reason you lose is because you suck. And that was what was so great about it. Also, music sounds great, and the story is, uh, you know, it's not about rescuing Peach over and over again. This one is a completely original story for the Mario series, and it's still really cool. You meet a bunch of really cool characters, like everyone's favorite, Gino. I wouldn't say he's my favorite, but I do like him a lot, Milo, and all these other characters in the game. The game but yeah, I just, I really, really like uh, Mario RPG. I would play it again and again, because it's the only one that... Well, it's one of the few that does, that gets me, like, engaged in an RPG game. Because every other RPG is just, 
the same thing, Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy Tactic. Press button, hope they don't fuck up, and then they get themselves fucking killed. You get angry, and it's like, well, I had no control over that. This one, you have control. And yeah, a lot of people say it's easy. The game's easy. But you know what? That's because you don't suck at the game. So shut the fuck up. This, if you find it easy, it means you don't suck. But yeah, only a few other games, like, kind of tried to follow the game, which, ironically, is the only series that follow, is the... is Mario's Superstar Song and the Mario and Luigi games, which, you know, it's good enough that I would actually play them, but not as good as the original, where it was just, it was just, it was just fun! And that's what I really liked about it, really nostalgic, and also looking at the, um, the strategy guide, which, once again, since I didn't know how to read or understand it, my cousin didn't know shit either, just... Oh, we just enjoyed looking at the pictures. Real nostalgia here. So this next game right here is has quite a bit of nostalgia. Like now that I think about it, if you if I think about like how I came across this game, and it's also kind of I don't know whether you'd say ironic or coincidence because uh, Illusion of Gaia is the spiritual successor to Soul Blazer. A game that Down Phoenix also put on his list in his uh, top five nostalgia games. Soul Blazer was all right. Uh, like it was definitely very interesting going backwards and seeing like, like uh, what was the game before Illusion of Gaia that Enix made. And oh, Soul Blazer was pretty neat for the time. I wouldn't say it's great, but Illusion of Gaia, Gaia fucking great. Got to talk about the backstory of how I got this game because it is it's quite interesting. Uh, thinking back to it. So back then at a flea market, saw a bunch of people like playing Link's Awakening on the computer. And to me, back then when I was like, I don't know, five, six, or seven, somewhere young, it's like, oh wow, that game looks so cool, I want it too. Oh yeah, they had, they had, they were playing Link's Awakening on a computer. What the fuck's a computer? This was all new at the time. It wasn't even called, well, it was a computer technically, but it was a Mac computer back then. And it was like, that's also, my, my first sighting of emulators. Of course, I didn't know what an emulator was, but I, I saw the game Link's Awakening and I was like, oh, so cool, this character, he just swings swords around and like, cutting leaves and shit. But of course, being young and not thinking properly, because, you know, young young kids are stupid, let's be honest, didn't, didn't remember, bother the, to remember what the title of the game was, or even like, look it up or ask about it, because, because, hey, 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 game prey. Yeah. So eventually it was like, oh hey, I want I want I want that game, I want Link's Link's Awakening. But not knowing that it's called Link's Awakening. So once again back to the same flea market, made the greatest mistake in my life in mistaking Illusion of Gaia for Link's Awakening. Because it came with a manual and it showed pictures. Oh yeah, ma manuals back then were really, really cool. See just like even seeing all the pictures is, is neat. But I uh, saw it. The game looks similar, I, and I don't know how, but it looked and played similarly, so I was just like, Oh, it's that game, it's that game, I want that game. Game, got it, made the greatest mistake of my life. Because, like, I got a, because Illusion of Gaia is, is on the same level or even better than Link's Awakening. Greatest mistake ever made by me, and it was so worth it. So yeah, let's actually talk about what's so nostalgic about it. Just like with Mario RPG, where I had to, where you had to figure out a lot of things. Like in this game, figuring out the stuff in here, um, like I felt very accomplished as a kid figuring out all, like how to get through all the stuff. And it also helped that the manual that came with it also has a mini guide. No, not even a mini guide, a full walkthrough of the entire game. That was so cool! That was the coolest thing. So it's tough to say if I, if I can judge this game fairly, being that as a kid, the manual came with a guide that essentially just spoiled everything, but I didn't care back then. It was just like, oh cool, I know all the secrets of here. Definitely helped with finding the red jewels. But uh, yeah, so figuring out the what to do in the game felt very accomplished and also uh, Probably helped me with uh, my reading because there is a lot of dialogue that you go through to read and also so flavor text where you talk to people and such, you know, typical stuff. So, thanks to mistaking it, mistaking it as, uh, what was it, uh, Link's Awakening, it essentially is a Zelda game. It plays 
essentially the same thing, but with its own twist on it, where it's not, you know, going through dungeons and stuff, you're going on a grand adventure. And what's the goal of the grand adventure? Well, this kid named Will just wants to find his dad, who disappeared somewhere when they were on a journey. That's it. But along the way, he ends up saving the entire world, so it feels kind of modest and that, you know, the whole grand scheme of saving the world is like weaved in, not subtly, but, you know, smoothly and not very forced upon you, like his father, his father didn't say anything about, Will, you're gonna save the world, so do it. No, it's just like, hey, I'm over here, but, the, but to find me, you gotta do this, this, and this. Will ends up unintentionally saving the world, and that's pretty cool. Also, there's so much good music in this game that like I really like. I have it on my phone. Also, the graphics look great. Like the sprite detail is just right. It's not too dense. It's not bland. It's just right. It feels rich and colorful. That's what I really like about it. Gameplay, well, like I said earlier, it plays like a Zelda game, and that's pretty cool. It's not as simplistic as well. It's slightly more complex than Zelda. You got. You can block, use special attacks, and just, just. But essentially, it's the same thing as Zelda. At the end, you fight certain bosses in certain places to grab these mystic statues to help save or help get to where your father is. But uh, yeah, Little Guy is such a great adventure to go through. Don't let any French Godzillas tell you otherwise, okay? Because this game is great, and I would definitely say it's. And I would definitely highly recommend this title. And also uh, for me, it's nostalgic factor for me because it's just it's it's like a it's like a it's like a storybook that you go through. It's just like you know, occasionally come back, read it, and just go through the adventure all over again. Uh, and the part where you go to the vampire the the ocean palace to fight vampires probably the most unintentionally scary part of the game for me. Oh yeah. Music very fitting in certain moods, like it just felt like that's what you would hear in the environments. Like, uh, like I said, with um, actually, no, not the Ocean Palace, no. There, there's, there's like a scary mood music in this game that's like really, really chilling for it. But, uh, yeah, enough talking about Illusion of the Guy, let's get to the next one. Alright, here's the next one. Now, you might be noticing that I've been picking, like, first-party Nintendo games for my nostalgia. Well, what's wrong with that? They're good games. It just so happens they're also nostalgic to me. Such as this one, Super Metroid. Why is it so nostalgic to me? Well, as a kid, I was really into sci-fi. Like, it was just the imagination, like, uh, going, like, beyond what was around, what was around at the time and what was around me being all normal and stuff, and Super Metroid was a sci-fi game. So yeah, I ended up like really, really liking it, and just, once again, like with the other games I mentioned, is that I felt very accomplished going through this game as a kid, because there was just, ah, you, there was just, there was just a lot of moments where it would have been simple for an adult for it to figure out, or someone way older than me, but as a kid it was just like, it was just like, you know, I didn't know this stuff, so when figuring it out, figuring it out, I've just felt so accomplished doing it. Like, for instance, uh, before you fight, uh, who is it? Who is that one boss? Who is that second boss you fought in Brinstar? Uh, Kraid, yeah. Kraid. For the longest time, I couldn't get the Kraid because I didn't, because I was really conservative of my, of like, my, my missiles, because it's like, oh, my special weapons, I should only use it for the boss. Fucking dumbass, indeed. But then, to be fair, the game never told me about blasting certain, well, a certain type of door with missiles. See, you see, because, uh, the, the, right before fighting Kray, there's this door where it has an eyeball on it, and it wasn't colored like, you know, the pink or green doors. So I was like, oh, this one must not use missiles or anything. Didn't realize that for the longest time, and so just like kept getting stuck for no reason. Potentially almost accidentally learning to speedrun, because, uh, you know, going through Norfair without the Varia suit. But uh, eventually figured out that, oh, you can shoot missiles in these fucking doors. Obviously, it didn't say fucking. Kept going through the entire game. 
And, you know, the adventure through the entire game is great. Just blasting things, collecting items, finding secrets, fighting bosses, and just like abs absorbing the atmosphere of the game. Music is great, as always, because it's just like, it was very, very fitting for like uh, certain places. And sometimes maybe not, but you know, it helped the mood of the music. Like, um, like after going through Brinstar, when you go to the, the sewer, the red sewer looking area, and it plays that really grim music where it's like, uh, you're all alone and it, go, and it creeps up on, on you and stuff. That was such a great track, probably one of my favorites. But yeah, going through another accomplished moment is figuring out how to get to... What was that water world where... It's, it's not Aquaria, but essentially there's this part where you had to use a power bomb to blow up a tube to get to, uh, to, get to the water area that uh, you've passed by several times. Randomly solved it and it was like, oh my god, I did not need to look up a guide to figure that out. Like. Uh, as, as much of a freak accident as it was, because I because it was just like on the map screen. Oh yeah, the map part of the thing is one of the best features, and uh, which is why I liked it over the original, uh, map, the previous Metroid games where they didn't have a map, and you know you had to draw it out, and the, you know the game would be huge and stuff. Super Metroid improved a lot over those previous games. But anyways, going back to that too, it's just it was just like. It always looked weird to me, like, when going through that area the first time, there's only three blocks of that ma of that area, and it was just like, hmm, something's weird, but then when you get to that point, most part of the map is revealed, but it's like, you end up right back over here, it's just like, I know there's something you gotta do, so what the fuck do I do? Shoot missiles everywhere, plant the bomb, then the tube cracks, and it's like, oh, I figured it out! And then went through the game as normal. Oh, and another part that, like, uh, it's also nostalgic is the, uh, crash ship where, where you fight, a uh, what was it, Fantoon, or, like, fuck was it, the, the Phantom Brain Squid, it was just like, that was fucking creepy as hell, especially with the music and the whole entire place is all desolate, is all desolated and isolated, like, nobody's on the ship, no one's alive anymore except for these ghosts around, it's like, there's ghosts in a sci-fi game, it's like, oh my god. That's fucking creepy. And you find this phantom mother brain. But yeah, graphics look great. It had a very, very rich uh, atmosphere, like uh, that's very fitting for the sci-fi part of it. Game, the action is great, and uh, it only gets better with time as you get better with the game. Because there's like so many tricks and things you can do. Like if you've seen any speed runs, there are so many ways to speed run Super Metroid because the game is so so well designed. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it's well designed, but it's also done in such a way that you can, you don't have to go it, go through it the normal way. You could, but you can also like um. Oh, what's that? What's that word called where you just uh, sequence break? Where you break the sequence, where you go to places where you're not supposed to be, and like you know that's really cool. No other game has done that, and that's kind of what made some of the future Metro games not as not as cool. Like for instance, uh, Metroid Fusion. You, you can't really sequence break the game. Nintendo just completely blocked it out, like, acting all like, No, you can't, you can't follow our narrative and stuff. Like, like, fuck you. It was so great breaking the game because it was thinking outside the box. Of course, I wasn't really able to do most of it, but it was still cool that I was able to. Oh, sh that reminds me. The part in Brinstar where you finally used the power bomb to go deep down this uh, hole that you couldn't access before got trapped there as a kid, and this was where I officially learned how to do, where, where you find these um, these little ostrich aliens, or alien ostrich um, birdies that, uh, oh wait no, they're not ostrich, these little, these little imps that, space imp that like uh, do wall jumping, that's where I, where I officially learned to wall jump, because I was gonna be, I was stuck there, and I didn't understand this concept of wall jumping. So when I finally figured it out, it was like, oh, it was like there was like a lock in my head that just completely shattered. It was like, now I get what's going. Now I get this whole mechanic and stuff. Um, but at that point, I was so depressed because I was like, I'm stuck here. I can't get out. Eventually figured it out. So that, that was kind of, that was quite a relief. The only other time I did wall jumping was in the Mighty Morphin Power Ranger game on Super Nintendo when it, when it too also trapped me in an area. But unlike Super Metroid, 
own. But unlike Super Metroid, it at least gave you a hint of what you're supposed to do. But yeah, Super Metroid, definitely a great fucking game that I'll play again and again, or at least after some time, we'll play it again. Alright, so one of the people I'm going to tag is D. Tysonator, who uh, plays retro game that is a great friend of mine who does many, many challenges, like beating De Battletoads No Death, just like uh, I did after his. Uh, Battletoads, Battletoads uh, No or no Hit Zits, and uh, beating Mike Tyson blindfolded. So, uh, definitely check him out. All of the stuff he posts is mostly on ANC Games. But anyways, I'm gonna tag him because uh, he probably has a lot of nostalgic games and, you know, he has a little, quite a few stories to talk about, little histories of games and stuff. Very, very interesting. So I would definitely, uh, let's just go and tag him for it. Now, another one would be Mini Ninjas, another friend of mine who does his retro ninja gaming and, and other stuff. With his retro ninja gaming, he just does, which ironic, is called RNG, does pretty much... Well, actually, I would say random games that go on, but mostly if it involves, but it mostly involves things that he's interested in, like um, well, ninjas for one, hence many ninjas, and other stuff like uh, like stuff that a lot he liked, like uh, RoboCop, Castlevania, and other such things like that. And one of his videos that I that I really really like was his Punisher video. Yes, yes, I know. So definitely would tag him for uh, asking him for his top five nostalgia games. Of course, I'm not gonna force him to do it. Another one is Mike Maverick, a good buddy of mine who also loves video games. And if you're gonna sneeze, sneeze! Video game reviews just like mine. He has a lot of. He's very energetic in his videos. Very passionate about it. And also does video game streams too. And uh, you know, it'd be fun to see what his Top five nostalgic games would be as well, seeing that he also know also knows a bunch of games that I don't know, and also uh, probably has has a few games that I also don't own that I wouldn't really know about. So definitely would tag him for it. Now, let's see. Another one is Obsessive Gamer that uh, someone I know, and he's also very passionate and well, mostly passionate about his video games. He also does video games reviews too, so, and he does uh, quite a few, if I remember correctly, he also did a, a few top, top number videos, so, hey, perhaps uh, this one would add to that, that top video list of uh, nostalgia games, so yeah, Obsessive Gamer, and I know who you are, top five nostalgic games, go, not gonna force you to do it though. And uh, last one, this one was kind of tough, trying to figure out who, who to tag for top five nostalgia game, but I decided to pick uh, the Retro Romancers. Those guys seem to have a lot of fun, like, playing video games and doing videos on them. They just seem, they just, yeah, it's two guys and, you know, they play games together and they seem to have a lot of fun doing it. Just, uh, very, very natural, not, not forced or scripted, just very natural, very natural and playing their video games and just doing, uh, you know, doing the stuff that they like. So, uh, yeah, I would tag them for the top five nostalgia games. Although in that case, I think uh, they'd each have to do their own, which would then be top 10-ish. All right, so there, top five nostalgic SNES games, because, well, my list was comprised mostly of SNES games, so I might as well have went with that as, as opposed to the overall nostalgic game. So, hopefully Down Phoenix is satisfied about that. Like I said, Probably didn't do the video right because talking about nostalgia is kind of tough, and also tag five other, five other people. But um, this is with War 100, you're the viewers, and I'm the reviewer. And in this case, the top videoer. Stay tuned for more for Battletoads! Genesis!